کسانی بود Welcome, Wallingford, to the 350th Moments of Wallingford's History. This is episode two, and tonight I'd like to welcome again uh, Jerry Farrell, Bob Beaumont, and Mary Beth Applegate. Thank you for being here. And Mary Beth, let's start with part of our moments. Okay, thank you very much. And what we're doing, as we did in the past, is talking about random historic moments in the town of Wallingford since its inception. And I am going to start with an event that began in 1913, when someone donated land at, on top of Mount Tom and asked it to be a state park. Well, even though Massachusetts and New York had state parks, Connecticut did not have one. And they didn't even have uh, rules, definitions, legislation, or anything to establish a state park. So in June of that year, a state parks commission was organized and they sat down to start researching locations and what they wanted to be in a park. But they didn't think about parks like we do now. They did not have the recreation facilities. Uh, it was simply a spot to stop and to rest at. And the state had the idea that they would have wayside parks. And they were going to be located throughout the state where people could stop, find rest, find shelter, a place to spend the night, to gas up their car, and to get oil. So the first thing they did is determine what do people want at a, at a state park. And water appeared to be a big attraction. So the first two places they looked were along the shoreline. And they started with the um, uh, Sherwood Island Park in Westport, and then Hammonasset Beach in Madison. And those were tremendous draws, so they decided to start moving inland. And the first one they decided to go with was Wharton Brook State Park, which is in Wallingford. And... Um, what they did is they bought 50 acres of land there and they began to put up the buildings. Now, uh, they chose that location because it was along Route 5, which was a direct route between New Haven and Springfield. And we have a map up here, which you can take a look at, and it shows Route 5 going up right by Wartonbrook Park, which is where the green area is, that's parking area. They began to uh, develop the area first by, <coughs> excuse me, first by cleaning out the swampy areas where there might be mosquitoes, <coughs> and then cleaning, setting up the front area and putting in the buildings that were going to be necessary. <coughs> and <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> trolley cars and the railway also ran directly by that area and again went up uh, between New Haven and uh, Springfield so that people could get off there and enjoy the park. But additionally, automo automobiles were becoming much more popular, so there were many cars in traffic along there. <coughs> in August 1919, Wattenbrook Wayside Park opened, and here is a picture of what it looked like when it first opened. <coughs> it had buildings across the front, you could pull in, you could rest there, you could get uh, your gasoline. You can see a gas pump standing up kind of in the middle. It looks like three lights. And where those lights are is the gas pump area. Behind that was a large area where people could camp overnight. And the idea was that it wouldn't cost them any money and it wouldn't cost the town any money to, to offer those facilities. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> They decided to track the cost for the first year, and in that first year, they took in $26,716, and they spent on supplies and help $26,042, which get, left them a surplus of $674. Now, that wasn't a lot, but that first year entailed all the expenses of building the facility. So they decided it definitely was going to be a worthwhile project, and they expanded it. Over the years, they added more land, so it went from uh, 50 acres up to 94 acres. And they developed a swimming area, and the pond is still stocked with fish every year for children or adults to go fishing there. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the wayside services are now long gone, and so are the memories of them being there. But the park is just as popular nowadays as it was back then. 
Well, it's great that you brought up the point about uh, Mount Tom because many of us as young Boy Scouts, and I know your children were in scouting for many, many years, and so was Bob's, but uh, many of us Boy Scouts uh, worked our way up to Mount Tom for our camping overnights back in the 50s and 60s and early 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, a dear friend of mine now owns a house up on top of Mount Tom, and it's funny to be able to go up there and see a lot of the remnants of us as scouts being able to go up there and enjoy the area. So, Bob Beaumont, what are you going to tell us about Raul Lufbery? Raul Lufbery. Well, people could, might, might say, well, why Raul, Raul Lufbery? Well, Raul Lufbery uh, passed away on uh, May 19th of 1918. He was a ace. He was, matter of fact, he was America's first flying ace in, in World War One. He was... <coughs> Born in France to a French mother and an American father. His father was a chemist, uh, heavily into, among other things, the rubber industry. Um, and he was also a known uh, stamp collector to the point. At one time, he claimed he had the biggest stamp collection in the world. I'm not sure if that's the case or not, but Lufbery was born in uh, 1885 in France. His mother died when he was 15 months old. His father left to come to the U back to the United States when Raul was 25 months old, leaving Raul and his two older brothers to be raised by his grandmother. Well, Raul ended up quitting school when he was 12, left home when he was in his teens, and started his worldwide tour, uh, going through Africa, going through, through various parts of Europe. Finally, about 1907, he ended up in the United States. The interesting thing is the day he arrived in the United States heading for Wallingford is the day that his father left to go back to France. Uh, so he never saw his father uh, again. He ended up living here with his brother uh, Charles for about a year and a half. <coughs> ended up then going on to become a you know worker down in New Orleans out to California. Ended up joining the service. Ended up joining the US Army ended up serving in the Philippines for a couple of years and it was from from when the from when he was uh, in the Philippines that he ended up uh, going from there meeting Mark Porp uh, who was a barnstormer in about 1909 or so and he became Porp's mechanic fast forward about five years they were back in they, they were in France by this point and this is at the beginning of the First World War. Porp very quickly went up and was shot down and from that point on Lutbury vowed to avenge his death. He was going to become a pilot, first as a bomber pilot, then sub subsequently as a fighter pilot. Um, his job as he saw it was strictly to kill as many Germans as he possibly could and that is what he did. Uh, he's credited with 16 kills uh, by, by the French, although his personal records show that he had as many as 73 that he had ta that he'd taken out, many of which were taken out behind the lines of, of the Germans, therefore could not be verified by two people, which is what the French required. Uh, so he ended up in the Lafayette Escadrille, uh, which was a group of Americans, primarily American Ivy Leaguers who wanted to go over and help the French fly, or help the French fight the war, I should say. And <coughs> Lufbury was the old man of the group. He was 31, 32 years old at the start of it, and, but he's, he, was, he became an excellent pilot. He became the, really the leading uh, ace of the um, escadrille, and when the U.S. entered the war in 1917, he ended up becoming the commander of the, of the 94th uh, uh, Army Group. And basically, he's the one that trained Eddie Rickenbacker and all the other um, aces that we had as Americans in 1918. He was known for flying a plane that was always in good mechanical shape. However, the day that he went up on May 19th, he borrowed somebody else's plane. That plane was not taken care of anywhere near as well as his own. He went up to go ahead and try to knock out a, an observation plane that the Germans had sent. 
Well, the long and the short of it is he got knocked out of the air in large part because of the fact that his weapon jammed. And without, a, you know, without having a machine gun, he could not compete. He, his plane got on fire. There was a question as to whether he jumped out or whether he fell out. Landed on a picket fence in a, in a garden in Tool. Well, that's, a, that's wonderful, Bob. And the picture behind you comes from uh, the VFW 591 on Prince Street. That's a great picture of Lufbery and his plane behind Bob Beaumont. And I, I take this as a special part of this because, Bob, um, like Bob said, Eddie Rickenbacker was taught by Lufbery, and so was Billy Mitchell. And Billy Mitchell was the guy that, that put together the famous B-25 Mitchell, and my yes. father flew in that plane during World War II. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is a, a great part of the, the history of Lufbery itself. Let's move on to Jerry Farrell. Well, Bob's, you know, recitation of some of the facts of Raoul Lufbery, I think brings up some other themes in Wallingford history that maybe we haven't covered. The, the story of Lufbery is a story of World War One. You know, here we are in 2018. That war is now a hundred years behind us, that it ended in that 1918 period. Um, you had people like Lufbery who were Wallingford people in one way or another who fought in France and other parts of Europe to liberate Europe and win the war for the Allies. Now, there were others. I vividly remember two of our World War I veterans, Leo Del Rosso mm -hmm. and Joe Condon, relating to me their experiences as young soldiers from Wallingford fighting in France. That they told me about how they were in a cave in France and they didn't know if they were going to get out and they talked about carving on the cave walls and they wondered what had ever happened to those carvings and I think it was one of their proudest moments several years later that National Geographic was doing a story on some of these caves in France that the American soldiers had occupied and they came across these carvings that Joe Condon and Leo Del Rosso had done, and they featured them in National Geographic. Um, you know, how, how circular life is, what a small world it is. Um, you know, Leo Del Rosso in particular, when you look at him, you know, his family had only been in the United States for a very short time. They were Italian immigrants. Leo went on to become one of our first selectmen in Wallingford, um, but so many of that group of, of doughboys, as they called them, the first World War I American soldiers from Wallingford, many of them were either immigrants themselves or the children of immigrants who had recently come to Wallingford. Um, I think it's a, n a nice piece of Wallingford's history that it reminds us of the diversity of our town, that we have people from so many walks of life and so many places that, you know, I think that really adds to the mosaic that is Wallingford. You know, right now, um, we see immigrants from a lot of the Spanish-speaking countries. We have a great ethnic society called the Spanish Community of Wallingford, SCOW as they call it. And that's actually another piece of Wallingford's history, that Wallingford has a very long history of these ethnic societies being formed at the time that immigrants come over. Um, they try to be helpful to the immigrants in assimilating into American society. Many of them are mutual benefit associations where they offer insurance if someone in the family were to die to be able to bury them. Um, you had a whole host of them around Wallingford the Hungarian Club, the St. Francis Society, the Spanish American Club. I mean, we could, amongst ourselves, probably come up with two dozen of them. And it's nice that that theme from way back in the early 20th century continues to today, that we want to help people, we want to see that they succeed, and that they become, you know, a, a welcomed part of the town.
Well, Longleaf has always been a great melting pot for many, many years ago. And just touching on Leo Del Rosso one more time, I remember working with him many years ago when I worked in the town. And Leo Del Rosso told me a very interesting thing that I've always kept to my heart. We always talked about Memorial Day. I've marched to many Memorial Day parades. He said, it's not Memorial Day. It's Decoration, Decoration Day. Day. And that has stuck with me to that day. Mm -hmm. Leo Del Rosso, Joe Condon, absolutely. To be able to remember a World War I veteran is something that's very, very important. Yes, Marika. <laughs> We are going to do a change of pace now. And yes, we got to move quick from, here. From World War I and go back uh, into the early days in Wallingford. <coughs> Wallingford was uh, settled in 1670, and at that time it included the town of Cheshire also. And it wasn't until uh, <coughs> the, toward the end of the uh, 1700s that Cheshire became a town of its own. Now, during this time, let's see, we have a map here which should show the yellow line coming down, and that divides the Wallingford and Cheshire line. <coughs> However, in those early days, it, that land was all, of, all was Wallingford, and the little <coughs> marks that are on there show the different locations of mine shafts and uh, tunnels and that sort of thing, where they anticipate or think that they are located. Unfortunately, there were no records kept of where the actual mines are located. <clears throat> the first sign of anything there was John Parker in 1711 was reported to have found copper on his farm. Now, to avoid having a rush, in 1714 <coughs> he was given 10 shillings so that he would keep this to himself. Keep it quiet, don't tell anybody that he found copper or anything of that sort on his farmland. <coughs> However, word did spread, and the governor of Massachusetts, along with other Massachusetts businessmen, came down, and they began buying up property there. They worked out an agreement with Wallingford that stated <coughs> they would be able to open mines there, and the miners and laborers connected with them would be exempted from all civil and military duties and all taxes. The leases would run eight years with the privilege of renewal for a period not exceeding 500 years in whole. So they had grand ideas about how much money they were going to make by doing this. This was in um, around 1714. By 1720s, they were all pulling out. They had put thousands of dollars into their mining and had nothing more than holes in the ground. Very little copper came out of those areas. And tradition says that some of those mines were had a 90-foot shaft large enough in two places to put a whole house into. And eventually, those shafts were just abandoned and filled with timbers and rubbish. Now, most of the mines in Connecticut are surface mines, but areas like that Wallingford Cheshire area had the um, what were called subsurface mines. And those are the ones that operated in the 17 and 1800s and where they dug for copper. Now, we have a picture here of what a copper mine would look like in the open shaft. And this is the kind of thing that was filled in with rubbish and debris over the years. However, if you were to go walking in those way back wooded areas, you had better keep your eyes to the ground because you're in areas there you never know where there could be an opening to an underground shaft. And actually, although they say that the risk of damage is very slight because they're in very wooded areas where it's not developed, they have been several cases in as recently as the year 2007 when Cheshire settled with uh, several families for $115,000 for damage of these tunnels and shafts underneath their property. So if you are going to go walking in those woods, keep an eye to the ground. Well, Bob Beaumont. I want to talk about one of my favorite um, so-called heroes of our country. And that would be Benedict Arnold. You know, a lot of people think of Benedict Arnold as a traitor. And yes, it, later on in the Revolutionary War, he was. At the onset of the Revolutionary War, at, based on when Lexington and Concord happened, on April 19th of 1775, the news reached here by post rider, when I say here, reached through Wallingford into New Haven uh, by 
April 21st. April 21st, Benedict Arnold, who was at the time captain in the Second Company Governor Stuttgart, comparatively newly formed uh, unit, he, dem he wanted to get his men together and go up to Boston to help out <coughs> his fellow Americans. Well, <coughs> Benedict Arnold was a little bit of an impetuous individual to begin with, and he, he, he rounded his men up. They were, they were all set to go. They went over. They were, they were blessed by Jonathan Edwards, uh, who was the leading pastor of his day uh, in the congregational way in New Haven. And then they went over and they demanded the keys to the powder house. The powder house, to begin with, was uh, under the control of Colonel Worcester. Colonel Worcester said, no, you know, we can't do this. I mean, you know, so we may need it for our own defense, etc. Somebody else may need it. It's not really ours just to allow you to take it. So he then demanded of the selectmen that he be given the keys to the powder house. And if he wasn't given the keys, he was going to take whatever he needed anyway. Well, he was given the keys. They did take. Now, why am I talking about New Haven when we're talking about Wallingford? Well, later that day, Benedict Arnold and the Second Company Governor's Foot Guard came through Wallingford. Matter of fact, they came through what we call South Main Street, North Main Street, and on their way to Boston and to Cambridge. So. We have a little bit of interesting history with regard to, to uh, Benedict Arnold uh, for having passed through here. In addition, I might just add two other members of the governor's foot guard at the time were a future vice president, one Aaron Burr, who spent a good bit of time in Wallingford at his uncle's place, Pierpont Edwards, grandson of Jonathan Edwards. Uh, both of those gentlemen were in the second company governor's foot guard. So, Wallingford, has, Wallingford is related to one of the most interesting and Cares most capable, for that matter, <laughs> generals that we had during the war. Bit of a head case, but he was <laughs> certainly an excellent, an excellent tactician, etc. Well, I think it's very interesting because uh, uh, two weeks ago we had Bob Beaumont and Mayor Dickinson down to New Haven for the reenactment of the demanding of the keys, and these are a copy of the keys. We own the original set of keys mm -hmm. for the powder house in our armory as it is, and Bob and Mayor Dickinson really enjoyed the point. Now, when Bob said they marched to Wallingford, this is the bearskin hat that they, they wore, and when they got as far as Meriden, the people in Meriden started shooting at the soldiers, and the reason why they started shooting at the soldiers is because they were wearing red coats. They looked like British troops. But the problem is, is that a lot of the people from the colonies wore the same type of uniforms as the British troops because it was the standard uniform for a soldier in those days. So I now yield to Jerry Farrell. Well, that's interesting that you, you say that the people of Meriden were confused as to whether they were American or British soldiers. There is another chapter in Wallingford history that I think if people were to hear it, again goes to this confusion during the period of the American Revolution that certainly one of the figures that um, we think of and hear of as most associated with the revolution was Benjamin Franklin. Um, Benjamin Franklin was the elder statesman of that whole period of the Continental Congress and you know helped provide some of the philosophical uh, underpinnings of the revolution. First postmaster also. First postmaster, yes. absolutely. Um, but you would be surprised to know that his son, William Franklin, was not so fervored in his American revolutionary uh, fervor. That William Franklin, the son, was the governor of New Jersey, the governor of New Jersey by appointment of the king. And during the American Revolution, rather than signing on with the American Revolutionary cause that his father was so identified with, uh, he became what we call a Tory, that someone who did not support the revolution, who supported the king remaining, 
the, the titular head of the United States and the 13 colonies remaining part of Great Britain. And where he comes into Wallingford's history is that after he is deposed as governor of New Jersey, um, he is a political prisoner at that point, and they're not quite sure what to do with him. They ship him to Wallingford, <laughs> and he spends some time here in Wallingford. He resides with the Carrington family in their home um, on what is now Simpson Court. The building was in the area where the Half Moon Cafe is now, more or less, um, and he spent a number of months here, in effect, as a, a political prisoner. One of the reasons that uh, Wallingford was selected was Wallingford was known as a place with a lot of revolutionary fervor. So they thought that no one was really going to be all that sympathetic to him. They would keep him under, not quite lock and key, but certainly um, he did not venture far. And I think that's a chapter mm -hmm. of Wallingford's history that people have long forgotten. So when you're at Half Moon Cafe, think of Benjamin, think of, you know, what he went through as a, a father having a Tory for a son. You know, when we talk about Carrington, Carrington was the first postmaster in, in Wallingford. And he's obviously buried mm -hmm. down in the Center Street Cemetery. And, and just on a quick note here, seeing that we only have a few more minutes left, most people don't know where Mick Street was in Wallingford. Mary Beth, do you know where Mick Street was? I do know where Mick Street was. Is that was. the place where we used to have soapbox derby races in the 50s and 60s? As a matter of fact? Yes. Well, I wouldn't know that. And we were very lucky that the Beaumont family used to bring <coughs> hay down there. The Wall family brought hay, and quite other different farmers brought hay down there so that the kids could race down the street on the first concrete road in Wallingford. So where was Mick Street? Mick Street is now what is called Christian Street. And that's because the St. Paul's Church at that time was located on the corner of Mick Street, and it was then renamed to Christian Street. So the starting, the starting point was just a little hair above uh, Moses White Beach School, and the finish line was a North Orchard Street extension so everybody could race down the street and end up pretty much on the bottom where Lala's was. But Let's go back a little bit there. What I miss, not growing up in Wallingford. <laughs> yeah, I think you did. But I'm sure you were on a soapbox derby racer back in those days. No, no way. <laughs> okay, Jerry, any other comments? Well, you bring up uh, Mick Street and now Christian Street. That neighborhood was very different at one point than it is now. But today it's the campus of Choate Rosemary Hall. And if you go to that intersection of North Elm and Christian Street, you know, a lot of what's there is a very bucolic campus that's spread out. The buildings are far from one another. Go back a hundred years, that was a residential neighborhood that was tightly knit with homes. Some of those homes are still there. Others have been moved to other parts of the campus, and others have been demolished. So when you say that St. Paul's existed on Mick Street, Christian Street, in the 1700s, 50s. That was, you know, uh, almost urban residential neighborhood for Wallingford. Not quite this bucolic campus that we know. But if you really, if you go up, if you go up North Ruisi Avenue, North Ruisi Avenue Extension, those streets that are all down that way. I, I had a, one of my friends brought up to my attention the other day. Think about most of those houses that are almost 100 years old on North Ruisi Avenue, and and the comment came up was. Look at all those little mom and pop stores that we had when we were kids. And I know you had, it was Drucker's up by you, right? It was uh, no, Doros. Doros. Chin, chin, Doros uh, store. But yep. we had Christian's Market. The blue laws were in effect on Sundays. Where would you go on Sundays to get a quart of milk? You go to the little stores. Right. Little you went to Christian's stores. store. You went to Clojy's sure. store. You went to Nash store. I mean, the stores were all over. You went to Lala's, there was milk there. I mean, all these little places survived because most of the big stores were closed on Sunday. Right. So, I mean, there was a huge mix in the center of town. We had Daly's Dairy on North Orchard Street. Well, you mentioned Daly's Dairy, and I'm going to hearken back to a gentleman you mentioned earlier, and that's Leo Del Rosso, because he Leo Del Rosso worked for Daly's Dairy for many, many years. And what people may not realize is that, you know, some people in Wallingford today may have heard of and may remember O.D. Foote. 
Well, the gentleman who made yeah. most of O.D. Foote's ice cream was Leo DeRosso. Well, listen, thank you very much for the second edition here of Wallingford's 350 Moments. Thank you for joining us tonight, and we truly look forward to seeing you again.